Next, we're going to be changing topics a little bit and talking about the World Trade Organization. The world trading system is under attack. The institutions that have safeguarded us since the Second World War are under threat. How can the World Trade Organization respond to this assault? In conversation now with Bloomberg's John Fraher is the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, Carl Bronner. Carl, thank you very much for joining us um, here today. Um, so as, as everyone in this room knows, I think we are in the middle um, of a trade war. Um, notwithstanding uh, the results of the midterm elections on Tuesday, that's likely to continue, um, given the um, US president's power over, over trade policy. And of course, the WTO is caught in the middle of this. But before we get into the trade war itself and what it means for the WTO, can you tell the audience here a little bit about why the WTO matters to the global trading system? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, before I answer your question, I would like to make a compliment to the organizers. This is the first time I'm here, and I'm very impressed how very well it is organized. It already started when I used the metro this morning and the guiding to the web summit, perfect. Um, the answer to your question. The WTO is about setting rules for international trade. And these rules have the purpose of giving people transparency, predictability, reliability. So you need all this in order to um, trade with international partners. The WTO is not about what people always say, free trade. It's about rules-guided globalization. So when you become a member of the WTO, you submit to the WTO, to the other members, your commitments. It's the easiest to understand if you look at customs tariffs. You commit to certain tariffs for certain products. You commit uh, to certain service uh, openness, allowing people to come and work in your country. For a certain time, you commit to the protection of intellectual property. This is what the WTO is about. And we have the expectation that people, peoples, follow the obligations that they have engaged in. So it's a, it's a policeman for the, the, for the global trading system. Did you say a policeman? But yes. No. Uh, oh. No. Because um, the WTO as such, the secretariat, different from the European Commission, um, has not the role to um, tell members, hey, you are not abiding by the rules. We have not the right to criticize the members. So if one member state feels that another one does not abide by the commitments that it engaged in, then this member state can sue the other mm -hmm. member state in the WTO. And we provide a dispute settlement mechanism mm -hmm. for um, those uh, partners who would like to have a quarrel resolved. So turning our attention to one very significant member of the WTO, uh, the United States, Trump's attack on the global trading system has attracted all of the headlines in the last few months, in the last two years or so. But you were telling me uh, before we came on, on stage here that relations between the WTO and the United States have been actually deteriorating long before uh, Trump uh, came into power. Can you tell us a little bit about how we got to this point yeah. before we talk about Trump? Um, before the WTO up to 1995, we had the GUT. The GUT was a much looser arrangement among a smaller group of members. And then in, 2000, in 1995, the WTO was founded and one of the driving forces in founding this organization were actually the US. And um, the US had the expectation that there would be massive liberalization. The US actually engaged itself in massive liberalization, for example, in the textile sector. And then there was the expectation that this would go hand in hand with targeted protection. So if unfair trade practices would be discovered, the US would have the possibility to to defend itself in a forceful fashion. And for this purpose, the US 
this is a very singular situation subjected itself to the dispute settlement system of the WTO. The US has not joined any other international court. They have not uh, um, been willing to subject their sovereignty to the rulings of an international court. In the WTO, they subjected themselves to the rulings of the dispute settlement system um, with the expectation that I just explained, massive liberalization, targeted protection. And when the system actually started to operate, they were of the feeling already early on that one part of the deal, namely this targeted protection, was not really working as they had expected because um, the way the disputes were resolved the US did not have the possibility to hand out anti-dumping duties as forceful as they had expected to do. And then they were also um, of the view that the um, appellate body, which is, we, we have an entry level and then we have an appeal level, that the appellate body who does the decisions, the final decisions, um, was um, not respecting its limits. They accuse the uh, appellate body of overreach and thereby infringing on US sovereignty in a way that um, they had wanted to prevent. Mm. So it's, it started already, the, the, the stress um, for the Americans already started, let's say, in 2002. Under Obama, we already had a situation where one of the members of the appellate body was denied a second term because the Americans felt that he was overreaching. Mm. And this gets to the core of the current crisis uh, in terms of the WTO's relationship with the US, right? This, it's coming down to this question about the appellate body and whether it can actually stay effective, whether it can actually you know, stay in place given the fact that the US is now refusing uh, to renew are threatening to refuse to renew the, um, its new membership. Yeah, what makes the WTO different from other international organizations is actually this dispute settlement mechanism. And the dispute settlement mechanism depends on a functioning appellate body. The appellate body has seven members and um, they have uh, terms of four years. A term can be renewed and currently we have four openings. There are only three members of the appellate body left. The US is blocking the appointment of replacements for those who left. There is no process currently going on to fill those four vacancies. So if um, we have no sign of starting the process of filling the vacancies, then next year in December, we will lose a functioning appellate body. Right now we have three left, three members form a division and can decide on a case. But in December 2019, um, two of those members will come to the end of their second term. And if they are not replaced, this is the end of the dispute settlement system. So what happens then? Um, so we still have the entry level. What um, states could decide is they could say up front, okay, we engage in litigation and we will accept the ruling of the um, first instance. This would be um, a very civilized way forward. Mm. Or they could say um, we decide up front that if we are not happy with the outcome of the first instance, we are going to have arbitration. We are going to have a form of arbitration which the WTO rulebook also envisages. To my mind, again, a civilized way forward because you take a decision without knowing what your situation will be in the future. And then the other way would be yeah, just to, to do nothing and doing nothing would mean that um, the actual system of executing the decisions could not work. 
So we would, for me, this would be a regression of civilization. We would go back to a situation where people probably do what they want to do. Mm. So we would not be as rules guided as we are right now anymore. This and do you see a, a risk that even the WTO itself could then become irrelevant in this situation? Say that again? Do you think the WTO could then become irrelevant in that situation? No, I don't think we will become irrelevant because um, the litigation or the dispute settlement resolution is only one of the elements of our work. We have a lot of committees in which we, um, in daily work, try to develop the rules and also try to implement the rules. We, for example, have a um, committee on technical barriers to trade. When you have an international standard on technology and you want to deviate from this uh, standard, you have to notify it in the WTO and people can object to a new standard by, and, and then it will be discussed as a trade concern. And um, in very many cases, uh, the new technical barrier to trade can be avoided through the process in these uh, committees. So this is one example where we um, have a, a role that will still work even if we do not have dispute settlement. Um, we do regular reports of the trade policy of all the members of the WTO. This is a monitoring process where you um, try to make sure that states abide by their obligations by reporting on what they do and then having a system of questioning which has elements of blame and shame. This is something like an, a persuasive authority to make sure that uh, countries abide by the obligations that they have engaged in. So this is will carry on. And then, of course, we also have the negotiation uh, part. Uh, this uh, is perhaps of interest for the uh, uh, people here. We have an, a topic that is currently very hotly debated, that is e-commerce and the rules and regulations that uh, would be necessary to facilitate e-commerce. This is happening. Or we have other issues like um, facilitating investment in uh, each other's country. This will go on. And is that, I mean, how optimistic are you that, that America's stance will actually change? I mean, as, as I said earlier, Trump gets all the headlines for provoking this trade war, but as you were pointing out, um, this happened a lot, this, this breakdown or this, this increase in tension in relations between the WTO and the US started long before Trump came in. Are you worried that this is what we're seeing now is a long-term shift in terms of America's views on global trade and that these, these tensions that threaten a lot of your core functionings are just going to get worse and worse? Okay, the US has um, undoubtedly been the leader um, in this organization for the last, if you take uh, the gut into consideration, for the last 70 years. America was the leader. Um, now America has rejected the role of uh, a leadership that um, actually formulates certain targets. But I see that there are other countries stepping in there are now reform processes being discussed. There are reform packages on the table which take on board the issues that the Americans have so far only voiced as complaints. The Americans have not said, here's the solution, please agree on it, but they have uh, only voiced what they dislike. And um, for example, the European Union has come up with a package that it takes on board very um, explicitly all the grievances that the Americans have listed, makes proposals on how to address them. And this has, to my mind, created a positive momentum, not yet sufficiently, but we are in the early stages of uh, discussing the reform process. And I hope that this will uh, lead to a situation where the Americans would come on board again uh, one of the issues is, of course, also the relationship between the U.S. and China, which is also addressed in this uh, reform package. 
uh, we also have elements of um, making sure that the member states follow the disciplines that they have engaged in. So I'm not uh, pessimistic. I mean, it, it can be done to uh, keep the system alive. And, and just more broadly, we only have a minute left. Do you think trade wars in the, in the near future are more likely now than they have been before, especially as question marks are raised about the dispute resolution mechanism at the WTO? Are we going to see more and more trade wars over the next five years? The, what we observe is um, if you look at world trade and you look at these various customs duties that have now been put on uh, bilateral trade, it is still below 3% of world trade. It is uh, important, but um, I don't think that we will see uh, trade wars uh, flaring up here and there. I think the majority or the l larger part of trade will be governed by the rules of the WTO as in the past. Okay, well, Carl, on that optimistic note, we have to wrap it up. Thank you very much for coming here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.